uh, white clover. Obviously, we're hearing a lot about that this year with with the increase in price of fertilizer, and then obviously multi-species swords, which took over uh, or took off last year, um, which is another step on from from uh, from white clover. So I suppose in the first video, John, we were kind of talking about grassland utilization and. Um, We've been dealing, our farmers in Ireland have been dealing a lot with grass over the last, well, since forever I suppose, but um, we've been kind of obsessed with growing tons and tons of grass, but we're, we're moving it towards now trying to, trying to utilise this grass that we grow, and it's, that is the key to efficiency. It's how much of the grass that we grow and spend money to grow, um, can we get into the cow or into the, into the sheep and, and get them to produce milk and meat from it. Um, and this is, the, this is supposed to be the true measure of sustainability. And, John mentioned in, we went through with, with John in the second video about grassland management to try and maximise utilisation. And I guess there's, just, there's nothing new in it really, it's, it's our, our three leaf principle and, and things like that. So I don't know, John, do you want to recap on a couple of the tips that you gave out for, for keeping the best quality of grass in front of, in front of animals? Yes, yeah, so I suppose um, where you're hoping to end up at the end of the year is probably governed an awful lot by where you start. So we would always say that. Try and start um, your first round, keep the, your covers as low as you possibly can. Try and aim to get to that low residual. Um, and I think if you get to the low residual at the very start, like at four, four and a half centimetres, um, I think what you find there is your quality is going to be good the whole way through then. Um, and that will have um, a positive knock-on effect, if you want to call it that, in terms that um, obviously production will be good then the whole year through, your quality will be good and then Production, when I mean production, I mean whether that be in uh, milk um, or, or you know, live weight gain in, in livestock. That will be improved on the back of that. Um, like Tom covered off um, during the videos as well, but I suppose the, the key is to, like, it's not necessarily about growing huge tons of grass. If we want huge tons of grass, we'll pick a grass variety that'll grow 30 tonne if it went to it. But it's all about the efficiency in terms of what they'll actually eat. And that's what we've been chasing and DLF in, in all the trial work we do. and of what we do on farm and monitor farms and so the, the key there is to try and get a variety of grass that will obviously grow big tons but that will have a very very high utilization rate and that's what's linked into what Chagas are doing with the likes of Thomas Tubbert down in Moor Park as well and, and look they're trying to achieve um, the best or trying to find the best varieties that they graze out the best and beyond that then it's it's all about using all that grass you know so it's, it's straightforward enough. Yeah, just on the, the PPI trait that Tomas is working on down in, in Moorpark, I think it's a really useful useful trait now to have and it's it's a bit of a breakthrough. Um I suppose that up to now the a lot of the evaluation trials are based on cutting systems and we didn't think about the poor elk cow that had to try and eat some of this grass or some of these varieties and, and now we're seeing we're we're getting the feedback from the cows and, and it's the same with what we're doing ourselves with our grass partner grazing trial and um, that you can see on some of the videos um we're, we're we're asking the cows and we're seeing what the cows like like to eat and and what they're what they're best able to eat to again increase increase the utilization um we go on to the clover we're getting a few questions in about clover obviously so clover is going to be a big thing this year with the price of fertilizer um there's a lot of research done on clover as well so it's a it's a forage and and it's a forage that we know a lot about um, and obviously the the big attraction with clover and, and white clover or red clover any legume is its ability to fix nitrogen and the likes of white clover has been shown to, to be able to fix up to 150 kilos worth of nitrogen per hectare per year which especially now in today's climate is a massive a massive uh, impact on your on your fertilizer bill which is, is one of the biggest costs on, on any farm so incorporating white clover into swords is something that maybe was neglected of late when, when fertilizer was so easy to get a hold of but uh, it's going to be a big thing this year now and I suppose incorporating it into Existing swords through over sowing is going to be is going to be really popular this year. I think uh, from speaking to farmers already, and um, so I suppose if if you if you have a look at some of the content we have on 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 our, on our website and on social media, and, and even we covered it in the videos, we went through uh, a couple of principles that we've come up with or that we're we're trying to trying to establish to to uh, over sow a clover. And so I suppose the first one of these is is to look at soil. So we always get asked about what method what method is the best to to oversaw a crop, but I think if you don't follow, if you don't keep an eye on these four guidelines, then then you're kind of you're you're not gonna gonna succeed too well. So if you think about the soil first, um, you want to try and oversaw into a into a paddock or a field that has has adequate soil uh, fertility. So we need to make sure our, our P's and K's and our pHs are in check, especially and that's that's probably even more so important for for the likes of white clover than it is for grass because the um, optimal soil fertility, the P's and K's and pHs. It's really important for the for the the nitrogen fixation side of things. So if you don't have those in check, 
you won't fix as much nitrogen, the plant won't, won't thrive as, as it should. And the next one then to do with soil is you want to be sowing it into a fairly open sward. So soil seed contact is important and, and to do this you want a, an open enough sward. So whether it's a, a sward that's kind of opening up itself naturally or, or if you, you try and agitate or, or create a bit of soil for the seed to go into with a, a grass harrow or something like that, um, either or it, it, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and then of course we, we want to roll the, roll the, roll the field after. Um, again, to just ensure that soil seed contact, because uh, I think the small seed of the clover, there's a big risk of it of it getting lost. Um, John, have you anything to add on that? No, I th yeah. Look, I think it's just you have to be practical about these things too. And like like that, I think a lot of times when people are are making decisions around putting in clover, I think if you, you know just follow what Thomas just said there. And beyond that, it's actually very straightforward. You know, um, like. We're on farm a lot, and we're talking to both farmers and merchants on this. And um, like, the clover is a very t a small seed, so like that, it needs all those component parts that Thomas has described. So, um, and I think if you follow those four principles, I say you're, you're going to be fine. You know, so um, and like where we would see issues is where people are going in, overseeding clover, and maybe straight away then maybe putting fertilizer back, um, and then driving on the, the, the part of the swart that's already there, whether that be a grass swart. So like what we would say generally is if you're overseeding with clover, go in at as low a cover you possibly can. Um, sow the seed, do all the bits Tom was talking about, make sure you roll the field. But like we would recommend that you would even try and keep that field grazed for 10 days, depending on when you start seeing the first of the clover plants emerging. Um, and, and even at that stage, I still would be holding back on, on fertilizer because the last thing you want is to create competition between what was there existing already and what clover is trying to come up. So, um, you know, just that, at that point, maybe like when you know the clover is established, you can drive it on. But again, um, clover is a legume. It's going to take nitrogen from the atmosphere. So again, just be very, very conscious. If you start putting on artificial fertilizer in terms of nitrogen on that, um, you're just basically going to make the clover lazy. Now, that's my lay way of saying that. Tom is the scientist. He'll probably give you a better explanation of that. But, you know, um, so once you get the seed into the ground or get it on the ground, you get your soil seed contact and, and all that sorted out. Um, light, uh, I think, and the aftercare is, as John mentioned, is something that sometimes gets neglected. So once the seed is in the ground, it's all about keeping light uh, into the into the base of the sward to give that seed the best chance of, of establishing and getting, getting that seedling up and, and strong uh, and getting light into it is, that, is, is, is the aim of the game at that stage. And that's where John mentioned about grazing. So we maybe graze it 10 days after after you sow the seed and um, uh, just try and eliminate any competition from the, the already established grass and, and just keep taking, removing the cover of grass on it. So whether it's 10 days straight after sowing or 10 days after sowing and then maybe at, at covers of around about 1,000, 1,100 kilograms um, for the next two or three rotations after that until you see the, the, the mature clover plants uh, in the sward then. And then obviously starting, once you have a, a sufficient cover, we're looking for 20, 30 percent uh, dry matter in the sward, we can start reducing our nitrogen then and letting the clover do its thing, uh, fixing the nitrogen for you at that stage. Yeah. Um, similar principles, well, we got a lot of questions in about over multi multi-species. Um, some people who want to do uh, do the same with multi-species, they might have good grass there that it might have been, might have sowed in the last couple of years and can they try and add a bit of diversity into it and get some of those effects that we know we all uh, we're starting to hear about now. So yeah, it's the same principle. Um, try and sow it into an open sward uh, at low covers after tight grazing or, or a silage cut, um, and then again keeping your keeping uh, keeping the, the the established grass uh, down uh, for the next few rotations. I know from talking to Kevin O'Hanlon, our partner farmer, who was our multi-species guru, if you will, um, he he did a bit of over sowing with plantain chicory last year, and he said for the first few rounds he wouldn't think anything was there. But every time you went after a certain point when, when the, the, the herb seeds got it got, got uh, germinated, every time you went into the field and grazed it off, there was more there was more uh, herbs coming in. So it is with clover, over sowing anything, it's it's a patient game and I think that's where we might miss out. We don't we're expecting instant results and, and it doesn't happen like that. So just to, this was a, it's a long term process to, to over sow these things and get them established on, on farm. Um if we talk about multi-species as well, have we got a few questions on multi-species? Yeah. Yeah, so I suppose you're probably after answering one or two of them already, but is multi-species suitable to be broadcast, spread and rolled in? Yeah, it, it probably is. Um, but again, I think you have to, 
you know, you have to look at what Tom has already covered there. In terms, like, you know, you have to have an open sport and all those, your fertility has to be correct. Um, so I say, yeah, look, maybe even let Tom finish off on that. But it, it can be done. But again, you have to always have your little checklist to make sure everything else is, is, is done properly before this can be done. Um, like I know Tom referenced Kevin O'Hanlon. Kevin has tried to do this several different ways at this stage and has done it several different ways and has had success. Um, but again, I think bottom line is when you're finished, whatever way you get the seed out, I think you have to have that good soil seed contact. Your fertility has to be right and you have to be conscious of the, the new seedling plant has to have light at all times. So, you know, you just, you need to kind of double check at all times that you're kind of giving it every chance to establish properly by using the principles that Tom was saying, similar to what we would suggest with a white clover over seed. Yeah, um, I suppose if we saw the, the multi-species and there's a video on that where we kind of catch up with with Kevin and uh, address, I suppose we address a few of the questions that we would have got last year. We would have seen a lot of it going out on farm last year. A lot of farmers trying, trying their, doing their own trials at home and, and sowing a couple of paddocks or five or six acres, 10 acres and seeing how they get on with the multi-species. And by all accounts, I think they're all, most they're positive reports. I haven't heard any any disaster stories with the common the common queries that we get. So the main concerns um, we were talking about, um, they're, they're weeds. So uh, how do I control weeds if I can't use any sprays on this? And we're not seeing weeds as an issue out in the farm. And the, the multi-species are doing what the, the research and the science is telling us is that once we get our six species, say, in the mixture established, and we get a good cover that the, the competition, the natural competition in the mixture is keeping out um, most of the bad weeds. So the ones like docks and thistles that we'd be worried about, the persistent ones, they're not getting a foothold in, in the in the sward, so there's no need for sprays. Little things like the annuals that we, we get, like chickweed and, and, and things like that, I suppose as long as there isn't a really bad outbreak and if you catch them on time, cows will graze that stuff out a lot of the time anyway. Um, so they're not they're not really much to be concerned about, I'd say. No. Um, um, yeah, like that, and I suppose when you're out on farm looking at these and look, we have we're looking at multi-species worse a lot uh, and in, increasingly every year. And um, so I suppose the practical thing is I suppose the concerns a lot of places. I'm just looking at another question: issues with docks or weeds. Um, you know, we we are gaining more experience every year at this. So I suppose we have we have more answers to the questions. The docks certainly were were the, one of the biggest questions that were people concerned about. But like. Um, Tom might explain this, but like docks are competing at the same level as the chicory plantain. They have a deep tap root and they also have a similar canopy above the ground. So when you have a plant that's similar, it's competing at the same level. You actually don't have the same problems maybe down the road. And like initially, if somebody said to me that was picking a paddock for it to try a multi-species wart, and uh, I might ask them whether docks were, you know, whether there was a big dock burden. And obviously pre-sowing, you would try and, you know, get rid of as many docks as you can with a program of, of maybe herbicide control. But um, now, to be honest, where we see docks and in with the multi-species forests, um, we're not as concerned because we've seen now with our experience over the last few years where they're being out-competed, as Tom said at the start, um, with the with the multi-species work being well able to out-compete them. So, like, it's not, as, not a concern that we have anymore. Yeah, it's essentially, like, the joke is, and you always hear it, oh, so you're trying to get so docks now. Um, so think of it like that. Yes, they they're cousins of docks, and they're doing the the docks job in the field. Uh, except they're a lot better quality, a lot yeah, better nutritional yeah. value than a dock. So if you can get that in before the dock comes in, whereas the, the dock has nowhere to go, uh, the chicory and the plantain are, are occupying that space in the sward. So it'll do a pretty they'll do a pretty good job keeping keeping the docks out. Um, the other questions we get about the multi species is about silage. Um, I suppose. We'd recommend it. I think its best value is probably in a as a grazing a grazing mixture, and um, so I think we it, it we would we predominantly use it for for grazing. But yes, you can make silage from it if you um, if you if you want. Uh, the the trick with it for making silage is and um, it's it's a very high or low dry matter crop. So we need to make sure that we're we're cutting the crop dry and, and making sure we get a good 24 hour or maybe more wilt depending on the question so or depending on the, the the condition so you probably want to be leaving yourself four or five good days if you're going to be be cutting this stuff for silage and as kevin said in the video 
and as my own work would have seen, uh, shown a couple of years ago, if you if you get the preservation right, if your dry matter is in order, you'll you'll carry the quality of the of the the crop in the ground through to the through to the pit or through to the bale. So, yeah, not the first port of call for it, but but we would, uh, it's it's possible. Um, yeah. Um, there's a few questions coming in there now, so we might just start um, pulling them off. Uh, Seamus asks, when oversold in the clover, when can fertilizer be applied? So I'll let you take that one, Tom. When oversold, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, so when oversold in the clover, when can fertilizer be applied? Uh, I would, I would be hung. I would be tight with fertilizer um, on oversown. I would give. I wouldn't do it for maybe a round or two after. I I I I'd give the I give the again. It comes back to letting your light in. And if we're grazing to try and let the light in, we're kind of defeating the purpose by, by going in and spreading a lot of fertilizer on it to to encourage the grass back. So as John always says, like driving with the with the foot and the brakes. Um, I would let I'd lay, lay off on the fertilizer for a, a rotation or two until you see the the until you see the the, the clover plants uh, growing and getting bigger. Um, and, and maybe just to clarify, when when we see fertilizer, I would probably say. Hold back in the nitrogen part, but if there is a requirement for P and K, you can you can obviously apply that. That's not going to have effect on the, the growth or whatever, but definitely hold back in the nitrogen. You know, um, and then as Tom says, maybe two or three rounds. Once you see the plant is established, you can give it you can give it nitrogen then. But like again, once the clover starts kicking in, there isn't a requirement for nitrogen anyway. But I suppose early in its development phase, it's not going to be taking nitrogen from the atmosphere. So I suppose you do have to feed the grass part of the plant. But as soon as you, you're you're happy that there is good establishment of establishment of your multi species or clover, and um, you can start applying fertilizer. But certainly, and we can cover this off later on. Once you haven't established either clover or multi species sport, um, and I see another question coming in here now actually on that, um, like uh, the management of a sport maybe in the spring or throughout the year. So again, like I just Tom, you can say that, and I can so, add if I need to. So David Fenley is wondering what. What is the best way to deal with your your multi species? Was so obviously sold it last year. So what's the best way to deal with your multi species now in the first rotation and, and at this time of the year? And I suppose I think I'd say a lot of farmers are surprised at how well it grew over the over the winter. Um, and at this t- it's at this time of the year and in the autumn time, you probably do want to be minding it, and it's more minding it from the weather. So I would let ground t- ground conditions dictate when I'm going in to graze it, but. Um, and I would maybe leave it. I'd, I'd leave it till the end of the rotation, uh, if if I could, to just to give it the best chance of having having a good cover on it. That conditions might be drying out, the ground will be drying out as we as we hopefully go into into the end of March and, and April. Uh, covers the sixteen hundred to two thousand as mentioned there. Yeah, I'd say that's probably going to be your target. Um, or you'd you'd happily graze at that uh, throughout the whole year. Covers the sixteen hundred to two thousand again. It looks like a high cover if it was a grass field, but the low dry matter in the crop, there's probably not as much feed in the multi-species as, as you think there is, uh, if you know what I mean. So I know in, in UCD, the guys are going into covers that would be the equivalent of two and a half thousand kilos. So there might not be two and a half thousand kilos in that, but it would look like a massive uh, mass of, of feed. But And the same on farm is it's, it's being cleaned out. Um, it's, it's really palatable stuff. It, it holds its quality a lot better uh, than grass. It doesn't seed out. Or go to go to seed and get stemmy like like grass does as quick. So yeah, um, on the on the the first rotation, I I kind of leave it till the end until until ground conditions become a bit better. Um, care can you sow clover on its own, or do you mix it with grass? No, absolutely, you can sow clover on its own. That's not a problem. Um, I suppose probably the, the biggest consideration there is often a practical one. Whether you have the machinery that that you're able to sow clover at maybe a kilo and a half or two kilos per acre. Um, and like we're not pushing any one machine over the other but I suppose there's there is lot, lots of machinery out there that can sow clover at those rates so again but I mean there's people out there equally are mixing clover in with a zero you know a, you know a compound that has no nitrogen in it and just mixing it in and I've heard I've seen and heard of all sorts of uh, you know ways of, of getting clover out there between it being agitated in with slurry or mixed in with fertilizer so look if you're able to get a uniform distribution of clover across the ground it doesn't really what met it doesn't matter what method you actually use and um, so yeah to answer your question yeah it can absolutely be sown on its own but equally you can sow with grass and i mean sometimes what you see is people will actually sow a half grade of grass with clover to maybe just replenish the, the grass part of the swart as well so like that's there's plenty of options mm-hmm. we 
go with the ground cover one? Yep. So Noel asked, and I presume this might be for multi-species or something like that, can you increase ground cover from poaching, uh, especially where animals walk on the most? Um, I think, does that refer to oversown owner? Yeah, Could, yeah. But obviously poaching is bad no matter what uh, crop you have. Um, and I suppose if it doesn't recover, then yeah, you're going to have to take have to take some kind of action. So whether it's a grass field, you might have to top it up with grass. Uh, if you've done damage to a multi-species, a field of multi-species or grass and clover, yeah, you're going to have to go back in again. And uh, in a in a, a perverse way, I suppose you have, you have the ideal conditions there. You've a lot of bare soil for the for the seed, the new seed to go into. So um, yeah, if you're if you're doing damage by poaching, well, no matter the crop. Uh, you'll have to go in with something with something to replace it. And I suppose to just add to Noel's question, if you have poaching and you have bare patches, if you don't fill them in, nature will. So nature will fill them in with, with weeds that you don't want there. So I suppose it's important to, as, as sometimes um, it's actually after creating an opportunity for to get back in with whether a better quality forage in terms of a new grass or a multi-species or a clover. But I certainly wouldn't be leaving it bare because you, all you'll have is You'll have weed grasses or weed, you know, weeds coming back in. So I so saw it, it's it is extremely important to get back in at that stage when the soil is probably tilled up a little bit. So nature's the animals are after actually doing the job for you there. So get in straight away and try and get your seed in. Um, uh, grazing efficiency of diploids versus tetraploids. That's you, Tom. Yeah, uh, it's something that we covered in I think it was the second video. Um, and as we said earlier on, we're, we're starting to think more about grazing efficiency and, and utilisation and I suppose all the research up to date would show or would suggest that, that tetraploids, um, tetraploid varieties of perennial ryegrass that is, they, they would be better in terms of grazing and their grazing performance than, than diploids and one of the main drivers for us using diploids in, in our mixtures at all is, is essentially comes down to ground cover and it's an aesthetic reason rather than necessarily a quality thing. So. Um, we would find that that it's it's well researched that the tetraploids have a better grazing quality. Animals perform slightly better on them. They're they're bigger plants. They've bigger bigger cells, so they've bigger digestible fractions, more sugar in them, a little bit less fiber in some cases. So they they might be might be a better better feed than compared to a diploid. And we're seeing that on our partner farm grazing trial as well, where on average, um, say the ten the ten tetraploid varieties are, are grazing out. Uh, better than the than the ten diploid varieties. So, is that the animals telling us that it's easier to graze them, or, or that they prefer? It's probably a combination of both. Um, and obviously, if you're getting more forage into the animal, it's going to be producing more more milk or more meat. So, yeah. Um, some of these questions. Uh, there, there's some fairly good questions coming in here now. Um, do you need to alter fertilizer program for multi species paddocks versus grass clover? And they're probably similar enough, but again. They'd be similar, so your grass clover sward is probably going to have more requirement for, for nitrogen uh, in this time of the year, uh, in the first half of the year, and, and possibly towards the end of the year, depending on, on how things are going with the weather. But yeah, so I guess Chagas have a handy fertilizer planner that you'll, you'll find online if you Google it, and it's kind of suggested rates for through each rotation. So up until kind of May, uh, when temperatures warm up and, and the clover start fixing the nitrogen, once you have sufficient cover of clover in the in the sward uh, once you get into May time you can start reducing your fertilizer um, and depending on how much clover is in it you can you can reduce it by by a good bit and um, probably 50 percent and maybe more if you're if you're willing to go that I think it's it's kind of like a game of chicken and egg or it's, it's like a chicken and egg thing with, with clover and, and how much fertilizer it if you ease off a lot on the, the fertilizer you'll, you'll really encourage and promote the, the white clover so it, it, it depends on, on your system can you afford to to take the risk and, and really back off with the with the nitrogen um, and push it and see how much push the white clover to the, to, to to its limit, I suppose. Yeah. Um, on the multi species part, I suppose what we've seen on a practical level on farm for the last four or five years is that um there are generally as we would have component part of our mixture would maybe have 55, 60 percent of grass. So obviously the clover is not going to kick in until late April, early May. So you have to feed the grass part of that mixture up to then. Um, and then at that stage, um, once the clover kicks in, you can actually pull the nitrogen part out and, and the clover will kick in, it'll feed the grass part, but equally it'll feed your, your chicory and plantain uh, within that swart as well. So, and that's what you're trying to do, like, you know, ideally you're trying, you have to let, 
I mean, if you've cows or, or, or cattle going out to ground early, there's no point in depending on clover in January, February, because it'll be still in a kind of a dormancy phase and it won't, it's not going to be drawn nitrogen down from the atmosphere. So you have to allow that, okay, we have clover here, it'll work, but not quite yet. So, you know, just build your program around that. So what we would see on farm is generally people might go out with the first two rounds with the same application of nitrogen that might have been used on the standard 100% perennial ryegrass paddocks. But then once they know the clover's kicking in, they pull the nitrogen part out and that will run alongside your perennial ryegrass swarts and produce as much, if not more, forage over that period of time without having to put any chemical nitrogen on it. So, and that's, look, we've a lot of experience in this at this stage, so that's what we're seeing on farm and that seems to be what's working. Just on clover there, we uh, forgot to mention it. What rate of clover would you use when over sown? So uh, the recommended was about two kilos, two and a half kilos to the acre. Yeah. So with over sowing, you're going to have a higher per percentage of loss. Um, seeds will get lost. Seeds won't make it to the ground. And um, the aim of the game is to, to try and reduce that by, by going with the points that we mentioned earlier on. So you're, you're factoring in a little bit of loss there. So you'll go slightly heavier if you're over sowing at two and a half, two kilos uh, white clover to the acre. Okay, yeah, there's some more questions here. Um, if it can be oversold, what method works best and what time of the year is best and so on rate, what so on rate is advised? Yeah. Um, so now I'm not altogether sure whether this is uh, directed at clover multi-species, but we might cover off both so people are aware of both. So uh, can it be oversold yet? They can all be oversold. Yeah, so we were talking a bit about the clover side of things earlier on. Um, rates of... Chicory plantain, we can go into that. Yeah, um, yeah. So we've covered the clover, so we would say kind of two, two and a half kilos if you're just putting in white clover and you're overseeding. If you were putting in a combination of chicory plantain and maybe clover, which would be common enough, and we probably see a little bit of that this year, and we have a product to do that. Pro to, to do that. So we have a, we're suggesting... Um, I think it's about two kilos of chicory, two kilos of plantain, and maybe one or one and a half of, of, of white clover. So... Again, you're allowing for that loss uh, that you might get with the with the oversown, and just making sure that you'll you'll get a good cover of, of the herbs uh, into that into that uh, into that pasture. Uh, the time of the year, um, for the clover and for I suppose for both of them, for the clover and for the herbs, because it's a as I mentioned earlier on, it's a kind of a long term thing. You want to be doing it at the start of the summer, uh, late spring, April, May. Would say when temperatures get up to around ten degrees, soil temperatures get up to around ten degrees, twelve degrees. And so we know that we're again we're minimizing the the losses there. Um, rain, I think, is something that we forget about, and something that might be detrimental to a lot of the the oversowing jobs that go on. We probably a lot of the oversowing would happen in the summertime when when things are dry, uh, in June, July, and and just the, the the clover the seed goes out and there's no rain and the seed just sits there, and and nothing happens. So I think if you go oversowing when there's rain in the forecast, and of course April May. Maybe into June you might get the best chance of a shower, and um, that that'll be the ideal time. And then that gives you time throughout the summer to to manage it and to encourage it, and and to to promote the clover and and the herbs uh, in the sward. Um, spring grazing fertilizer application. I think we covered that. Uh, did you were you talk, you mentioned that a minute ago, John? But what yeah. I just add to that. Spring grazing on your multi species or spring fertilizer on your multi species. Uh, it, it also depends on what kind of ground you have and, and your demand for, for spring grass. Um, I mentioned earlier on about leaving it maybe last in your rotation. You're, again, you're giving it the best chance to put on a cover uh, by itself without, without using any nitrogen on it. Uh, it's, I think the less nitrogen, the better you can put on this uh, in terms of persistence and, and in terms of uh, this was cost effectiveness as well. So if you're leaving it until the end of your first rotation to graze, there, 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 there's a good chance there'd be a decent cover on it. If you did want to push it on a little bit, um, what are we re recommending? Probably like say fifty or sixty units in in the first split between between the first two rotations. And um, again, ground conditions will dictate as well. It, it's it's more about mind. I wouldn't be in too much of a rush to go to get into your multi species in 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 the first in the first early stages of the year. And um, again, ground conditions will dictate. Um, whether it's 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 suitable to go into it or not. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, another few questions after coming in. Um, is there uh, is there uh, soil types? And I say what they mean by this is, and if I say on the multi species, then are certain herbs 
best or better suited to certain soil types and we would say yes so again um like even what we would see kind of when we're looking at sports definitely the likes of plantain will tolerate wetter soils better no actually well i suppose it depends it, it um sorry so no, there's i'm trying to look at two questions and answer questions so apologies i might let tom take this one yeah so there's if you take the six species mix for example there's there's a range of species in that some of them will some of them really like light dry soils hot weather and some of them are a bit hardier so I suppose the whole the idea of it is that you have something in there for all occasions and um, the likes of timothy um, and plantain probably don't mind are, are a bit har are, are hardy in the grand scheme of things they they probably don't mind the cold and the wet as much as something like chicory so the idea is that you're you're kind of tr you, it, each species is an insurance policy against a different uh, type of condition obviously there is no plant that will suit all conditions so that's why we use mixtures why we use mixtures of varieties of grasses there's no ideal perennial ryegrass variety so we have a ones with strong spring growth good summer growth good quality and, and all the rest of it so again it's it's just taking that that theory a couple of steps further and, and using different species and um, try and play them off each other so we've got a, a good consistent supply of forage across the year so be it your your grasses are carrying you through the early part of the year in the spring then your your herbs and your legumes are taking you through the summertime when when the grasses might be might be doing doing as well or doing as much or as productive as as they would have been earlier on in the year uh we have another question there about somebody who's after uh, acquiring a new farm wanted receded um for sheep and is it okay to cut when is the ideal time to recede well i'd say when when soil temperatures are up um in the spring i'd say like look middle of april and beyond um and is it okay to cut it in its first year and ideally no you'd like generally if it was receded this year that you wouldn't cut it this year because it can have an effect persistency down the road um and i mentioned maybe cutting hay off it if you're trying to cut hay off a newly receded swart you're probably going to struggle because it's going to be that lush it's going to be very very green there'll be no fiber in it because it won't have created you know a, a very fibrous space to it until later in the year so i would be saying probably look try and avoid cutting it in its first year anyway um and just mentioned yeah and even clover so yeah i'd say again tom mentioned the overseeding we've talked a good bit about overseeding but generally the best way of establishing clover is on a conventional reseed at the very start so you'll actually get away with putting in less clover seed in to end up with the same clover content in your swart when you're trying to overseed after you have competition there's something already established and um, so you're you know you're going to struggle to get the same uh, level of of a take as such um Sorry, the questions are coming in strong and fast, so we're trying to keep up with everything here. Um, uh, issues with grazing and multi-species. Um, now, this comes up quite a lot, I suppose. Um, cows like that have been used to um, grazing um, perennial ryegrass all their lives. When they're first shown the, the multi-species, um, you might have a little bit of hesitation on it first uh, around, but to be honest with you, when cows get the taste of it, um, they will graze this and that's where it probably comes into its own in the summer months when you do maybe get drier times that you can actually allow a multi-species swart go to a much higher cover and because it's so palatable cows will just continue to graze and you'll get you know you know the you know, all the benefits of in where you can leave a swart longer on the ground or a, a mixture longer on the ground um at higher covers but the cows will still graze it out every bit as good as if it was at a 1500 1600 cover so it's think, like one farmer said it's like eating porridge all week and then getting the fry on sunday they, <laughs> they like yeah. the the change and the diversity yeah. in it yeah yeah um, and even look i suppose it's again like eating the perennial ryegrass and then they're getting a, basically a salad bowl when they get multi-species swarf so um okay some of the questions are kind of starting to come in more about grass here now um yeah i think we've answered that one um yeah, we covered off utilization in some of the in one of the videos as well, and I suppose some of the people are just asking. And there was a question there between diploids and tetraploids. Um, like we have monitor farms around the country, and Tom um does an awful lot of work where we have our trial pots. I might let Tom explain what he does, and then we can I can answer some of the questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we tried to, as I was saying about utilization, we're we're trying to look into that more ourselves and. What we've done with four of our partner farmers is we've um, put 21, four, 21, we've sown 21 varieties in three by seven meter plots in the middle of a paddock. And we repeat this twice. So the lads have 42 plots uh, in, in one of their paddocks uh, for, on four different farms. 
And I suppose 10 of those are varieties that we all know and that we've been using for the last year. They're, they're all on the PPI list. They're the, the best ones available. And I suppose DLF as a, as a research organisation as well and a, a, a grass breeder, we're, more in, we're very interested or equally interested in, in the, the 11 varieties that we have that are probably three or four years away from, from being in a bag to be sown by, uh, by the public yet. So we're getting, we're, we're getting a, another, another um, aspect or another angle on, on the, the quality of, of these new varieties, and especially in Ireland where it's predominantly grazing. Um, a lot of the evaluation is done by, by the department is done and even by ourselves in, in Waterford is done with a, a cutting machine with a halogen harvester um, where it's cut it's under a, 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 a machine cutting it so we don't really know what the cows might think by the time these varieties do come to the market we don't really know uh, we're, we're, whether whether they're going to graze out as well as we'd like them to so with these trials we're getting we're getting a head start on that we're getting the heads up and uh, basically what I do is um, I for before every 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 grazing, we'll say they're they're managed as as normal in the in the grazing rotation. The paddock is so I go out. The lads ring me up and I go out on uh, the day before the, the paddocks are grazed. I take a pre grazing uh, sward measurement to 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 get the height and the yield. Uh, I take a, a quality sample as well. And the cows come in after me and they graze away. And then I come in after the cows again and I take the post grazing sward height. So I know how much of each variety that the cows have eaten. So we can get the we can calculate our utilized yield then as well. And then maybe by inference you can you can probably guess that if a cow if if a plot is consistently being grazed down lower than its neighbour, then do the cows prefer this one, or is it is it is it showing a car? Is it does it have a, a property that that makes it easier for the cow to graze? And again, if it's easier for the cow to graze, it's going to eat more of it. More utilisation uh, is more more product. Uh, so so that's essentially the the gist of what we're trying to do, and uh, we're getting a lot of. Of really interesting data on it, not only on, on utilization, but it was on grassland management in general. And there's a couple of questions that came in there about the best time to sow. Um, so anything. So what we would have found after we so we sowed these plots back in the autumn of 2020, uh, in August and September. And uh, what we saw, we we would have sown two two farms in the, in early August and two farms in late September. Uh, by chance, it's just the way it worked out. And what we noticed then the following spring. Is that the farms that sowed in August had about a ton more grass on average in that field in the plots uh, than the farms that sowed a month later? So that's what the message behind that is: is to get it in to get your grass sown. Is if you're going for autumn sowing, which is probably what a lot of people do, get your grass in as early as you can in in the autumn and um, in August preferably. Uh, it's going in at a time when the weather is more likely to be to be favourable for for establishment. It's also the, the aftercare of the new sward as well. So you get to go in with your post. You've plenty of opportunity with the weather-wise and time to get in with your, your post-emergent spray to get in, get in control of any weeds that might be there. You can get in and give it its first graze in six or eight weeks after it's sown and let it tiller out. And then in, if, you, if, you, if you get it sown in time and established in time like that, you're, you're hitting the ground running the next rotation. You're going into a, a, a fairly well-established grass you're you're going into your fourteen or fifteen hundred kilo uh, covers the the following year, whereas the lads who are a month late, the they were the, the plots were still kind of in their establishment phase, and um, by the time we came around the following March, and they weren't getting the the immediate payback, um on on the on the reseeding um as as quick as the guys who went in early. So yeah, and I suppose um one of the key probably things that's coming out of our trials, and obviously um, and I'm sure Thomas Hubbard would say something similar is what we're seeing is kind of, and again, well, you're doing all the research, so what are you seeing or what are they preferentially grazing to more often than not? Uh, on average, I suppose we've only been doing it for a year and there's another year to go this year before we have any open days or anything like that, but uh, on average, the tetraploids are, are grazing out um, slightly better than the other. Now it's, I think I uh, said in the video, it was 0.4 centimetres, so they're grazing out 40 mil lower on average than, than the diploids, which doesn't sound like much, but... If you take your rule of thumb as one centimetre is worth 250 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, 0.4 of this is about 100 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And we want to get our 10 grazings. If you're getting 100 kilos extra in every grazing, that's your that's your one tonne of grass utilised, one extra tonne of grass utilised over the year. And the a lot of the, the research posts would show, would, would suggest that, that that's worth in around 180 euro uh, per hectare, or 180 euro per hectare, yeah. Uh, in in extra extra output, so 
obviously that'll change now with fertilizer prices and things, but it just shows you the more grass that you can get in, even those small little gains can yeah. make a big difference. Like when you add it up over what, 200 cows, 100 cows, over 10 grazings, like it, it does add up. So the little gains are, will, make, will, will add up to big, big changes. Like Yeah, I just see a question coming in here now again. Um, somebody's just asked about any concerns about uh, density within a tetraploid. Um, no, to be honest, and so I suppose we would have, in our own breeding programme, we'd probably be focusing on this the last few years and again, conscious of getting it out on the farm. So, like the densities, a lot of the tetraploids that are there now are over 6, so that's 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. So, for example, like we have a product, 4N Grazer, which is a 100% tetraploid product with very, very good density. And as it happens, all five star grasses for grazing utilisation. So, like, you know. It, it'll grow the grass, but it, it'll have a very, very high rate of utilisation. But any concerns that somebody may have about density then and poaching after is not a concern. And like we have this on some of our monitor farms, and I won't mention names, but some of them are probably heavier and wetter than others. And yet we have the likes of these mixtures there and we don't have issues with poaching. And I suppose the other side of it is coming from maybe the amenity part of, of the business that tetraploids are being used in sports pitches now because they have a better rate of recovery so again if you have a whole group of people running around the field and they're trying to destroy it with boots well cows are going to go in and, and maybe you know poach the field but again with your rate of recovery on a tetraploid that's not an issue anymore so i suppose and that's based on what we search we've done and we see it on farm from a practical level so we're not concerned anymore as i, as I said we have that the likes of that four grazer mixture from dlf and um, that an all tetraploid mixture and it's kind of ticking every box in terms of you know growing the grass with high utilization rates and no concerns around poaching or anything after because they're not what you would call your old traditional more upright tetraploids they're you know uh, to be honest with you even when people come out to our trial grounds they often find it very hard to distinguish between what they look at and when, when they're looking at a diploid you know so um, just to jump back to multi species, two very good questions after coming in there. Uh, the first one is from Seamus Barry, and he's wondering about is there any results on the DMD of multi species swords in mid midsummer, or what would it be like? Um, I suppose yeah. When I was doing my work with with Chagas a few years ago, we would have looked at the DMD of a multi species in a silage system, so we can kind of infer about that. Um, the so what we found in in say our second and third cut in, in June and into August, July and August. The, on paper, the 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 DMD value, so say the DMD value might be slightly lower than you'd still be in your seventies, but it'd be slightly lower than what your what the grass was giving you. But it, it's kind of a false it's kind of a false reading to just take it as, as black and white like that on paper. It, it, because when you consider the 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 ways that the clover and the the herbs are digested and the way they are treated inside in the animal in its digestive system, it's it, it, it breaks down a lot easier and a lot better in, in, in the room. And so um, it, it, measuring it in the lab is not the same as measuring it in the animal. And as we said earlier on about palatability, the intakes with the multi-species and even with a grass white clover sward compared to a, a grass only sward, the, the addition of the clover and the herbs makes it much more palatable. So intakes are up and at the end of the day it's intakes the intakes are driving the, the increased output and, and that would be fairly well well researched. So as I said earlier on, with the multi-species and even with a grass clover sword, if you've enough clover in it, you're going to get a quality kick in the middle of summer when your your grass is naturally starting to, to want to get stemmy anyway. So if I think the ideal scenario eventually is going to be how do we play multi, how do we combine multi-species and perennial ryegrass paddocks in, in our system and how do we use them best to, to maximise our our growth and quality in the spring and our growth and quality in, in the in the summer and, and how we play them off each other is going to be a big a big key to that I think. Yeah. And then there's another one I oh, sorry we'll just do the, the yeah. red clover yeah, yeah. in the in the short term lay. Uh, would red clover work in a multi species sward potentially without grass in a two year rotation with cereal? I would say yes. Um, and if you were going to I don't know rent that out for, for grazing something like sheep, a mixture containing red clover, plantain, chicory, I think would be an excellent short term mixture. Uh, for finishing finishing lambs or finishing finishing anything, really, uh, there will be serious feeding value in in a in a mixture like that, and it would do it would do really good stuff for your soil as well, especially in your in your arable situation there. You think about the amount of nitrogen that's going to be fixed there, uh, then you bring animals into it, depositing nitrogen and, and, and organic matter as well, and you think of your deep rooting red clover and your deep rooting chicory, 
and what it is doing to the soil as well. So yeah, I think I would I would definitely be be thinking about something like that in a, in an hour of a rotation if I had the space for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I might let you. There's a long question after coming in. I might let Tom read that one, and I'll answer another one that's a little bit shorter. Um, so I have what percentage of grazing platform uh, would uh, multi species be ideal for? So I suppose based on what we were saying earlier on that multi species is not going to fulfill uh, the you know the grazing that kind of wedge you need at the very start of the spring. If you have a very early farm and you need and you have potential to get cows out in January or February, allowing that multi species the clover won't kick in until April. Um, we would say like kind of a rule of thumb here and this is kind of open to everyone's farm 25-30% of the platform maybe in multi-species once you know how to manage it once you have experience of using it we're not saying go in year one and try and establish 35 or 25 or 30% of your, your platform um, and even I, we were on farm earlier on and Tom had a question in terms of like the grazing platform can work or the silage platform can work for the grazing part of the early part of the spring you know, graze it off, have the quality to be ready for silage, and then use your multi-species once it kicks in in the spring. Um, yeah, so I was, what I was saying to the guys that were talking earlier on was that it, 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 they, they do complement each other nicely, so I get the, the best practice advice is to get into your silage ground first, in the first rotation, get it grazed off, get it closed up, clear out the rubbish that's built up over the winter, and, and you're set up then for your quality silage in, in May and June. Uh, if that's ideal, if you're letting your multi-species uh, wait till the end of the rotation, get in and get to concentrate on your silage ground first, um, and then get into your multi-species after. So, so yeah, it, I think it doesn't. When we think about it, even a little bit, it it, it does become clear on how, how we can use them together. Uh, there is a question from Angie about climate-related issues and disease. Uh, now, disease not so much of an issue in Ireland, um, but I suppose we probably are with climate change and the way that that is going and the way that it's predicted to grow to going warmer wetter climate things like disease or disease like rust and things like that are, are probably going to become more of an issue for us here um drought especially obviously we've seen in the last four years it's probably been three depending on what part of the country you're in you've probably had a, a bad run of drought as well so yeah they are becoming concerns and, and you do get it more and more from farmers with their inquiries what the, the things that they're looking for drought is definitely getting up the list of, of priorities yeah. um, and disease resistance in tetraploids versus diploids uh, not exactly sure but again from like what John was saying about the, the amenity side of things in the sports turf I do I think there is there is evidence that some of the, the tetraploids that we would be that DLF would have anyway that they are a bit bit hardier they are well I can I can recall in 2018 and our trial ground is, is in a very very dry farm in 2018, when the drought kicked in, the tetraploids hung on longer in terms of they were greener for longer. And the minute we got the first of the moisture back, they recovered quicker. So to, like, it's not very scientific, but just on a visual, it was very obvious within the plots where we had a mixture of tetraploids and diploids. The tetraploids were definitely greener for longer and recovered faster. So look, as I said, it's not very scientific. It was a visual, but definitely it was noticeable that anywhere there was either monocultures of tetraploids are a higher percentage of tetraploids within the mixture that did recover quicker you know okay, yeah and then bringing that on with multi-species and drought uh, yes they would be they're, they've been shown to be slightly more uh, tolerant of stress and in extreme stress like drought they they've been shown to recover quicker uh, from drought if they do if they do get get impacted so yeah again going into the deep root species the the summer species or the the warm weather species they're definitely built better built to cope with, with the the onset of, of, of climate change and drier weather, I suppose. Um, there's a couple about red clover from uh, Seamus Considine as well. Uh, what is the best way to establish it and how to keep it around? Um, the best way to establish it, uh, I suppose it doesn't matter what machines you use, but um, again, soil fertility is important. Uh, so your P's and K's and your pH you, uh, need to be optimal. Your pH needs to be well up into the sixes. So 6.3, 6 6.5 um, pH is in lime and pH, good pH is important for the, the nitrogen fixation part of it, for the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria. Um, and it is, a co it, uh, the next question then you ask is, is about silage, would red clover silage be a good investment? Yes, red clover is, uh, is, is a, a, silage, um, a silage crop I suppose, and yes with fertilizer prices I would say it is because it'll grow for, for almost nothing. 
Um, and the best way to keep it around is to, to not use nitrogen on it. So there's your, it's it's a win-win from that side, Seamus. And uh, yeah, so what we recommend a four cut, kind of working on a four cut per year system. Um, in say in an established coat in an established crop you'd be coming in um looking to take your first cut mid May, the end of May, and then you're cutting at seven, six to eight weeks um for uh, for three three cuts after that. Um just to add to that, maybe what you would see sometimes is where you'd have anywhere between thirty and fifty percent red clover mixed in with a maybe a hybrid grass. Um and Often we get asked the question, what we would we recommend in terms of the start, allowing that maybe the clover's not kicked in, um, and this is kind of a, can be debated at times. Um, like for the first cut, you probably will want to put on a small amount of nitrogen, but there is now uh, information to suggest or, or research to suggest that even if you don't put nitrogen on the first round, you'll actually get a total volume over the four cuts of more silage than you would by putting nitrogen on the first one, because again, it just it it creates a, a, this, the clover will basically start working earlier so you might have a smaller first cut but then your incremental cut second third and fourth will actually the total volume of silage that will be recovered from that field will be higher than if you were to put fertilizer on at the start so sometimes it's kind of a case of you have to hang tough and maybe just allow the clover do its job just remember why you're sowing a red clover silage crop is for a high protein crop for no fertilizer so if you want a a high first cut, I'd go with a grass a grass mixture and, and just use the fertilizer on that. We're gonna get our payback from our clover silage in cuts two and three and four with our, our high yield and our high protein. You might have to take a little yield penalty on, on the first cut because we don't want to spread any nitrogen on it. So we're just gonna to have to suck that one up and, and we'll get our, our protein payback yeah. in yeah. over the summer when the when the clover is going strong. Um Seamus and multi species again uh, The best action to apply seed to the soil and should it be rolled? So yes, it should be rolled. Um, and if you have the time, roll it before you sow the seed as well, just to to make sure it's going into a, a firm seedbed and, and there's no holes and there's no cracks for those small seeds to get into. Um, if, you place, if you place a seed on the soil, um, an air seed or something like yeah, that, yeah. if you are drilling it no more than a centimetre, you want to leave it as close to the surface as possible and then roll it again. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty much very similar to what you do with with regular grass seeds so yeah we often get asked that question actually especially the last two years where people maybe have never used multi-species before and in terms of a, a seed rate like we would generally say if if your seed rate for grass seed is 13 14 kilos an acre um you can pretty much allow probably the same you probably put it back a small bit on the, the multi-species maybe 12 kilos an acre total if it's of a conventional re reseed as such but like that the very same component parts um you know your fertility has to be right so probably the starting point any of these recedes is have a soil test done and make sure everything is correct there and then i think the critical part and thomas said it is is to make sure you roll that field properly and what we would have seen probably in say the likes of 2018 where we had very dry conditions and um, we would have seen an awful lot of um, recedes struggling to establish and yet the headlands were always perfect because the field had been rolled twice from just a machine turning at the headlands so Again, just roll the field, have the patience to roll it slow and roll it properly. And, and you know, you're given, as Tom said, those seeds are tiny, tiny seeds. So the, the better chance you give it of kind of that soil, or that soil seed contact, the better chance you're going to have a good establishment. Yeah. The end of that question. Yeah, we're, we've, a, <laughs> we've a half a question here. Um, Somebody's asked the question, what are the benefits of multi-species swarts and what do the herbs within the swarts do? So, um, so I suppose the multi-species in total, it's it's the whole package. So like you have the clover, you have the herbs. So like yeah, we let you cover that. It's I suppose your with the biggest one at the minute is is you're growing the same amount of forage. I suppose you would with a grass a grass ward on on with high nitrogen. You're growing the same amount of forage for for almost no nitrogen at all. So that's obviously a big attraction for this year, uh, and the way things are probably going to go, and um, the. Uh, the benefits of the herbs and I suppose when you when you add in all those those different species they're all doing a different job they're all bringing different qualities to the to the sword so we know all about grass and and it's 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 qualities but the likes of the clovers they're they're high in protein you're looking at about 20 percent on their own you're looking at about 20 percent protein in in red and white clover so it's bringing that to the mix 
Um, it's bringing palatability. It's bringing quality uh, in the summertime. The same with the herbs. They are they would be pretty compared to perennial ryegrass in the summertime. They'd be fairly high in protein. They'd have a high sugar content. They've got a good mineral profile as well, which is kind of their unique selling point. They would have really uh, good concentrations of the likes of copper and selenium, and magnesium, in in chicory and plantain. So there's there's benefits there, and research has shown as well. There's benefits to to animal health and and the amount of dosing required on on the likes of lambs and things like that, uh, because of the inclusion of those herbs or, or chicory in particular, um, and then once you get out of the production side of things and growing grass and feeding animals, you've got all a lot of environmental benefits potentially to come down tracks as well. Like we talked about soil conditioning in in a in an arable rotation with the different rooting depths, and um, obviously fixing clo or fixing nitrogen um, and and putting it into the soil if you're if you're continuing on with a follow on crop. Uh, drought tolerance which is a big issue in some parts of the country you know two of our three of our partner farmers probably would suffer regularly from drought um, and we'll, we'll follow their story I suppose over the over the coming years and see how they're getting on with with the multi-species and, and drought and um, the suggestions maybe with carbon it's a big topic as well soil carbon and, and uh, carbon credits things like that there's probably evidence that your multi-species are going to sequester more carbon again because of that deeper deeper root and depth and probably higher productivity in the in the system overall that these mixtures are going uh, to sequester a little bit more carbon so look we're only we're very early into this i suppose and there is a lot of research to be done we've got years and years and years of ryegrass and even clover research but these mixtures are there's six species instead of one in a mixture and they're they're doing a lot of things that we probably will never even find out what's going on between some of them and uh, so there's a lot of work to be done um, and it is going on, there's a lot of trials going on, there's a lot of interest in it, as we can even see from all the questions that come in here tonight now, there's, there's massive interest in it, um, and, and it's up to the, the guys in the research to, to get the answers to these questions. Um, are we nearly out of time, John? I'd say we are, <laughs> we're well over bed. time, so apologies, and look, again, if we have missed any question, because we're, we're looking at a couple of screens here, um, apologies, and if you want, just people maybe remind us, and we'll try and get back to all of them again at any stage, um, you know, whether you want to go on the website or just get our contact details there, any of the team are more than welcome to talk to anyone at any stage if they have any queries or questions. Um, if you want, just what we did talk about, we, we, we did cover, we covered a lot of, a lot of the questions that we got in here tonight are answered in our, in our series. So if you check out, get onto our, our YouTube channel or any of our Facebooks or Twitters, they're, all the, the five videos are up on there for the last week and we have a multi-species kind of more focused multi-species series of videos that we did last year, you'll be able to go back and find those where we got really stuck into the whole topic and uh, we, there's a lot of good content and, and management tips on that. Um, we've got a couple of resources online as well. We've got agronomy guides for multi-species, a bit of over -sown, clover kind of things as well. So check out uh, dlf.ie for all that kind of stuff. And of course, if you have any more questions, you can contact John um, or send us any comments on on, on the social media, uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that regularly as well. Um, I suppose finally, we just want to thank all the, the contributors who starred in our videos over the weekend, who gave us their practical experience and their time to, to tell us what they've learned and, and how they're doing things on, on their own farms at home. So we've got Frank, Frank Crinion, Slane, Eamon Kent in, in Waterford here, uh, Billy Glasheen in Waterford as well, Tomas Tubbert down in Moorpark doing the research on, on the whole utilisation thing. Um, and Kevin O'Hanlon, uh, our multi-species man in Carlow as well. Uh, so I think that's it. Have you anything to add, John? No, I suppose I just like to add. I'd like to thank all the DLF team for all the work in the background here this evening as well. So we've just been doing the easy job where we're we're just answering the questions. Um, and again, apologies if we've missed any questions. But again, more than welcome to take. Um, even if you want to contact the office, uh, we're on oh five one, eight nine seven zero six zero. And as I said, all our contact details are on um, any of our kind of online platforms. So look, there should be no reason that you can't contact us, and we'll we'll kind of we'll endeavour to get back to everyone as soon as we can. And um, we'd also like to thank actually everyone has contributed in terms of the questions. There's some really good questions here this evening, and it's uh, it's good to see that so many people were engaged in with it. So thanks very much to everyone there. Um, and at that, then I think we're pretty much covered off. Yep. So, all right. See you later. Thank you very much, everyone.